Good morning and welcome along to Monday Morning's OTB AM and what a Monday morning it is. The clocks have gone forward, the sunshine is back and GAA is dominating all the back pages this morning. It feels like it should be the height of July but it's only the 26th of March. A very good morning to you, Oshin Langan. A very good morning to you, Owen. I'm excited. I, there's something about this championship vibe, even though it's not championship, that just gets me really excited after an incredible weekend of Gaelic Games. It's splashed everywhere, as I say, and it just feels like we're in the wrong time of year right now. It's like we're four months ahead of time. It was one of those weekends where no one saw it coming. Everyone was like, oh, it's just going to be a normal weekend of sport. And then you realise, no, it's a GAA weekend. It dominated everything. It was what we were all talking about. And, and why not? You had great games. You had teams who needed to win or needed to draw Mayo's case to avoid an almighty drop. And they would have dropped into Division 2. And then even if they had, you'd be like, still the same team going into Championship, really. And it's the same for all of them. Donegal, you know, Division 2, no real harm. But it seems like the worst thing in the world. Uh, this weekend because you've got such a long gap to championship and how are you supposed to fill in the time with positive talk when you've dropped to division two there's nothing there but yeah great weekend of sport it helps as well to sensationalize those feelings at Donegal people and people like the, from Derry for example this morning as well that the pain of relegation will be enhanced because of the added I guess veneer of importance yeah. that's put on this because nothing else was happening well let's be honest with Donegal going down to division two it's not that big a deal had Mayo gone down to division two it would have been the usual talk about Mayo there's always some negative stick to beat Mayo with right up until they give us a heroic performance in the All-Ireland final and people say we didn't see that coming I often wonder have people studied the history of Mayo? Have they looked at this Mayo team when they're analysing Mayo games in the Championship and the League? Derry are different. For them to go down to Division 4, let's be honest, it's humbling and it's humiliating. It's where they should not be. Uh, when you think just, what, five, six years ago, they were in a League Division 1 final. And then to go from that to dropping like a stone into Division 4, it's horrific. They've got a young manager. He was the minor manager last year. So obviously, as the manager, a lot of focus will go on him. But generally, when a team does what Derry have done, it's not just because of one thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, sorry to, to take your positive vibe and <laughs> drag it down there. That's what, that's what it's all about. I mean, negative vibes add some level of importance to anything, really. Yeah. There was other stuff happening this weekend. There was, of course, Munster in action against Scarlets, Leinster against Ospreys. But really, it's when it comes to club rugby, it's this weekend. And you had that kind of weird marriage as well, where it was this international friendly-only break <laughs> in March. So it just added extra weight onto all of that. So we, we will be getting stuck into a little bit of, of the soccer as well later on. Dan McDonald's going to join us a little bit later on in the show to reflect on Ireland's defeat to Turkey on Friday night. As I say, it was a huge weekend of GE. So we're going to be reflecting on all of the weekend's action uh, with a couple of GA voices throughout the morning. There's one GA voice though, and he's the only GA voice I care about right now, and that is you, Oshin oh, Langan. Thanks. I mean, a, a real hurling man, uh, the the man of hurling, as some people say. And I want to get your hot hurling takes this morning because you saw you watched a lot of hurling yes. at the weekend. Well, what makes what what makes you happier as a hurling snob than anything else? What is, what's the one thing that really makes us hurling people happy? What do hurling snobs love more than anything else? Uh, seeing other sports fail? Well, no, aside from that, I mean, that's a given, but aside from that... Uh, no, but, but it's, it's, it's not even seeing other sports fail. It's kind of feeling sorry for other sports that they're not hurling. We're not vicious about it. We're not like, oh, you're just not hurling. It's kind of like, oh, geez, it's not hurling. You know, it's not their fault they're not hurling. Aside from that, we love when a weaker county does something great in hurling or we love <laughs> hurling people are from weaker counties because they're really keeping the game alive they're battling against the odds well we may as well get uh, stuck straight into that there's four uh, burning questions I've got and I want your hot takes as a result of that and we'll start with that one so okay. it's Carlo Genny promotion to 1B one of the stories of the weekend so my question to you is how big is the bandwagon potential here with Carlo so how much of the, uh, how much of a chance is there of them causing a shock against a Dublin or a Wexford or a Limerick let's say in the next two to three years not in championship but certainly in league uh, they were up four or five years ago in 1B and they performed really well now sadly they didn't get any results but they drove Limerick pretty close in one memorable game uh, they didn't really I think they took one beat down but aside from that they were very competitive uh, we know that they've got a spine of players from Mount Leinster Rangers granted it's a few years since they got to the All-Ireland final but there's a few young guys coming through as well you have to keep in mind as well they've got IT Carlo, which is now a hotbed IT Carlo have been performing ridiculously well in the Fitzgibbon Cup over the last couple of years under DJ Carey now obviously that's not all Carlo lads but there is a good few Carlo lads there so I think there's a possibility that they could stay up and next year they look at the likes of Leash and possibly Dublin, and they'd say, right, those are games we could give a rattle. Offaly, if they continue their upward trend, I can't see them beating Offaly, but you just never know. So it's more than possible they could be competitive 
in Division 1B and when that bandwagon starts, boy, will we all jump on it. But they've got a, a very experienced manager in, in the shape of Conal Bonner and they've got some really, really decent players. I mean, I was really impressed with them now against Westmeath in the 2A final on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, that's a lukewarm take. I'll give you that. Very measured, probably accurate, unfortunately. They'll probably win the All-Ireland within five years. Is that what you're looking for? <laughs> Kula. How oh, do they wow. rank in terms of one of the great all-time club sides? Well, they've done two in a row, so they're up there with Burr and Portumna. And when you think of their team, there are standout players. And when you think of those Burr and Portumna teams, there are standout players. And that's the kind of measure. So from Kula, Sean Moran, outstanding. Uh, spent a little bit of time in the Dublin panel. Didn't quite make it as an inter-county hurler back then. Could very easily do it now. A really classy, composed centre-back. My man of the match. Oshin Goff, for years, has been a Tigerish cornerback. And uh, again, Dublin will be glad to get him back. Keen O'Callaghan at the back, very, very solid. Dara O'Connell, originally a Kerry man, but has been playing for Dublin for the last couple of years. Dara did a job. Dara's a classy hurler, but he actually dropped back to mark Adrian Breen because Adrian Breen was ripping them a new one. Dara seemed to be the only man that had the pace for it, and Dara did his job admirably. I spoke to Anthony Daly, who of course coached in Kerry, previous Dublin manager, and he said the Kerry lads would have a good attitude. He wouldn't be, you know, he wouldn't have an ego. He wouldn't mind being told, look, you have to go back and man mark this man. Your job yeah, is to yeah. stop him. Because you can imagine if you're a decent hurler in a team, like if someone says to me, go and stop someone, I don't mind because I can't hurl. But imagine if you're Dara O'Connell and you can hurl and you're one of the best stick men out there and you're told, actually, you're man marking. You know, that could be hard to take, but he's took it's, it. It's and an he ego did killer. It. Yeah, but he did it, and now he's got a second All Ireland Club medal in his pocket. So call it. Who is the greatest club team of all time in hurling? Portumna for me, probably because they're the one I, I fell in love with. Um, just watching them and kind of they were the first ones I followed up close. I went to a lot of their games, and you know they had the likes. They have a lot of likable people involved. Ollie Canning, uh, Joe Canning, obviously, um, uh, Damien Hayes, uh, Chunky Hayes. They just and they had all the ingredients that you want from a club team. You know the local lads. Um, you know, some of them would have had good, successful minor careers, mm. uh, invested in the community, all the cliched boxes ticked. So what I'm hearing today, up in headlines, block caps, hurling man Ushin Langan says, Kula have a lot to do to reach Port Humna's level. There's the hot take I'm looking for. Yeah. The next one, uh, the penultimate one, Tipperary, after that performance yesterday, Rona Maher gets sent off, kind of brush Dublin aside. What are the chances Tip just brush everybody aside this year? No, uh, because Dublin physically aren't up to a Tipperary yet. Now, when they get the Kula players back, they'll have a bit more of a spine. There was a bit of something about Dublin yesterday. It wasn't all negative, but they won't brush everyone aside. They certainly won't brush the likes of uh, Waterford and Limerick and Clare and Cork aside in the Munster Championship. But look, we know that Championship is Championship and League is League. You know? and <laughs> That's very good analysis right we there. Know, we know, we sure know. The, the grass is cut, the smell of Championship cut grass. Look, they, 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 they certainly have it in them to, to win the All-Ireland this year. But like Galway, as has been pointed out by Shane Stapleton, uh, and now two-time All-Ireland winner Kula, <laughs> are monsters. Like they're yeah. absolute monsters. Indian summer, Shane Stapleton, we should call him as well, got a lot more game time in this year's finals than he did in last year's I, final. And do you know what, jokes aside, I slag him off, um, but he put in unbelievable work to get himself right and get himself yeah. back in that team. Unbelievable work. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be chatting to Shane over the coming days. Well, I hope not. Um, I hope not too, but yeah. unfortunately that's just the way these things work. Uh, last one then. Uh, obviously another very memorable day in Wexford it almost feels a little bit too early but uh, still what are the chances to take a big proper scalp in mid-July or beyond this year? Well last year Davey would have said they had to peak a little bit earlier than everyone else because they needed a running start we mentioned there about Tip's physicality I, I think there isn't much between all the top teams and Wexford have caught up even that bit further now so yeah it's more than possible especially when you have the home and away thing and Wexford won't fear anyone um, now obviously if Wexford don't win the All-Ireland this year it will be pointed out that Davy Fitz was distracted by being at the Dancing with the Stars final last night. And rightfully so. Rightfully so. That is to blame. But yeah, look, of course, you know, why not? I mean, the, everything about their progress has shown that they're on an upward curve. So it is absolutely believable that they could take another big championship scalp or two this year, uh, like, like they did last year in beating Kilkenny. Yeah, good stuff. There were, uh, that was the first ever edition of Hot Hurling Takes with Oshin Langan. I think we might be back for a second edition uh, shortly yes. in the future. There will be even better, well, maybe not better analysis, but just as good analysis. analysis. There will be some analysis. Uh, there will be some analysis yeah. later on. Dahi Regan will join us at around 8.45 to review what was a pretty great weekend of hurling. We're also going to have Larry Finnerty and Brendan Deveni on uh, shortly in about 10 minutes time to review uh, the weekend's football action, of course. Mayo surviving by the skin of their teeth. We'll also get Brendan's thoughts on some of the other Ulster counties because it was a very, very eventful weekend 
recommended for the likes of Fermanagh uh, and for the likes of uh, Derry as well. We'll also chat a little bit about Armagh, considering we didn't chat about them since they secured their promotion to Division 2 last week. We'll also be chatting, as I say, to Dan MacDonnell about Ireland's loss to Turkey on Friday night. And we've got another special report coming your way at around 9am off the balls. Darren Cleary was down in Athena on Saturday to talk about that plan to rid them of some of their facilities as a result of the new metro in North Dublin. But now, it's time to take a look at the back pages. OTB AM In association with AIR Get AIR Sport Free with AIR Broadband We shall start with the Irish Independent, Oshin Yes we will, Mayo saved themselves but now they must save the summer Mayo with a dramatic draw yesterday against Donegal, a draw that they scarcely deserved if you were to believe some pundits I only watched the highlights of it because I was at Crow Park for the challenge game and the hurling but uh, yeah, it was dramatic stuff. It was the most Mayo finale to a match one could ask for. And as pointed out by Kieran Cunningham of the Star, who's a good man for pointing out um, kind of sporting memories and stats, it was uh, McLaughlin again who saved them, as he did mm. in London a couple of years ago in James Horan's first game in charge. And he really stepped up. Now, uh, what was interesting, and we'll get into this a bit with, uh, with Larry later on and Brendan as well, that Donegal cut out Andy Moran and Conor Loftus stepped up. Yeah. as he did in one or two championship games last season. But he's got to be a go-to man. He's got to do that in every game this season. And if he does, and Dermot and Killian find a bit of form and Andy keeps his form, then we're starting that Mayo bandwagon again. And I'm getting excited about it. We are, and we aren't, though. I mean, look who they brought off the bench yesterday, Alan Freeman and Barry Moran. I mean, that, that's something I, I want to put to, to Larry as well a little bit later on. I agree with you. If Loftus' ceiling is a little bit higher than some people think, then they're onto a winner there with him because they desperately need every bit of a gem that they that they consider unearthing at the moment to come very, very good because they're very, very short in the forwards when you see the two boys coming on. No disrespect to them, they've been great servants to Mayo, but it's time for a new breed, you would suspect. And Loftus with six points yesterday, good performance. Only one of them from play, though. Uh, as I say, we'll get into that a little bit more later on. It's Mayo dominating pretty much every back page this morning, isn't it? It is indeed. To the examiner, as sweet shop boys, last gap McLaughlin point spares Mayo from relegation. You can see what it means to Aidan O'Shea by uh, his reaction, the fist pumping, the double fist pumping. Not quite John Milan, he was more of a one fist pump man. But uh, yeah, that's two fist pumps from uh, Aidan O'Shea. And some bad news for Munster potentially. It's kind of hidden away given the GA weekend that it was. Mm. But Simon Zebo has a hamstring injury and Andrew Conway is looking pretty dodgy as well for the game against Toulon next weekend in the Champions Cup. Now, that's two of your three, uh, back three out. If, that's, if the injuries are as bad as feared, we don't know how bad they are, but that would be a huge loss yeah. for Munster and something we'll get into uh, maybe a little bit later on. It's been a really, really bad start to the week for Munster, given that news. Uh, okay, the Earl's news isn't that, new, isn't that new, but then you look at Toulon yesterday, 49-0 against Claremont. Uh, an unbelievable result. And there was that fear back in January that it was like, okay, you'd rather get uh, Toulon than La Rochelle because La Rochelle are powering ahead, they're informed, they're the reigning champions yeah. of the top 14. And then there was always that inkling, it's like, wait a minute, look at the players Toulon have. Yeah. They could come roaring back into form at any stage, just like it was when Chelsea drew Barcelona in the Champions League. People were like, oh, don't worry about Barcelona, they're not playing that well. Then all of a sudden, they were absolutely killing La Liga and uh, they didn't saunter past uh, Chelsea in the end. They did, I guess, in the second leg. But I, I think there is an element of the Toulon-Barcelona kind of symmetry there. And it's a worrying start to the week for Munster. But it's all set up for a, a magical, magical weekend in uh, Thomond, isn't it? Yeah, just let the forwards dominate a la old school Munster. Yeah, I did actually forget about Keith Earls when I was talking about Andrew Conway and Simon Zebo there. That mm. would be a massive, massive loss, Huge. especially given the form that Earls is in. But, Owen, uh, as you're aware, I can always take a positive from a negative. You know, what kind of side did Claremont pick or did they turn up? You know the yeah, French teams yeah, yeah, away yeah. from home. Yeah, they, they, I'd say Claremont wasn't, weren't up for it. They were classic yeah. French. Oh, wait, they were playing a French team. <laughs> uh, let's move to the mirror. Uh, look, more Mayo. Late, late shows. Mayo and Cavan seal Division 1 spots in last gap thrillers. Cavan with a win against Tipperary. A good game by all accounts. Um, a little bit of football. Jose Eyes Tierney. Apparently, Manchester United manager Jose Mourinho is looking at uh, Celtic defender Kieran Tierney, who's building up a bit of a reputation in the SPL. He's a, he's, a, he's a hot young prospect. Irish stars target jump into the top flight. Certain Irish stars looking maybe at some Premier League moves. Uh, let's go to the star. Never say die. And uh, this time O'Shea with, with the Milan one fist, <laughs> fist pump. Uh, obviously this is about Mayo. Wenger's age fury, writes David Woods. Arsene Wenger has hit back at calls for him to quit Arsenal by branding any exit talk as age discrimination. That's... Um, that's that's just excuse making at its finest from Arsene Wenger there. It's not that you know I'm doing a terrible job. It's my age. Mm. 
Well, sorry. See, the thing is, is uh, he's doing a terrible job by the standards he has set himself. He's actually doing a great job by other standards. And like, like, compare them to Spurs. Spurs fans bang on about how they're on top now. Still haven't won anything. Yeah. Still haven't got any silverware. Is it on the record that you're also an Arsenal fan? Uh, it uh, is am I, am I No, it is. No, it, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, do you also feel like I'm also an Arsenal fan? Do you also feel the same level of complete apathy, where uh, like there's almost this macabre sense of actually, I don't mind seeing them fail and fail miserably. This is actually very interesting, and I don't care about this club anymore. Well, uh, my following of Arsenal is a weird one because it's from afar. Um, I'm not invested in it like I am with the Waterford Hurlers or like I am with uh, with Cork City in the League of Ireland. Yes, the Waterford Man who supports Cork City. I lived in Cork. When I first started following it's League graceful. of Ireland, it was, it was Cork City I went to watch, you know. Um, it, it is disgraceful, but I'm okay with it. Um, I, I never want them to fail, you know. There's always that little place in uh, my heart for them. I don't think any Arsenal fan wants them to fail. They want Wenger gone, and if losing a few ma- games means that will happen, grand. But we know that's not how it works. If that was the case, if that's how it worked, Wenger would already be gone. But of course... He's not, and now he's going to win the Europa League. But, but my sense is that it's it's funner no, to fall it. down a snake than climb a ladder. So I'm kind of enjoying this spiral out of control, which is as long as they don't spiral too far out of control and they get it back together eventually. You know, yeah, I'm they happy always about. kind of regather and get control just makes just a good enough, story. Just enough. Let's move to the Irish Times. Leinster and Munster injury worries pose Euro problems. Uh, both Leinster and Munster with some injury worries. Uh, Dave Carney, or maybe it's Rob, who can tell the difference? Uh, a possible injury doubt for Leinster and uh, Mayo. Stay up, but Keegan out for up to four months. Dislocated his shoulder, got surgery on it last week. He will be an incalculable loss to Mayo mm. uh, for that game against Galway on May 13th in Castle Bar. That's going to be a cracker. I can't wait for that, I have to say. Uh, let's move to the Irish Daily Mail. Uh, back in a race. Mayo save uh, Mayo safe as Keegan KO. This is more on Lee Keegan's shoulder injury and Mayo staying up. And Gilroy to call on phenomenal cooler players. He said he'll be making calls over the next couple of days to see what cooler boys will be coming back. And when, I guess they've got a bit of time now until the championship starts. But you want to get them back and you want to get them integrated. But for Kula and every other club in Dublin, they're back in action in the next couple of weeks. Like yeah, the, the, yeah. The, 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 the club championship in Dublin in hurling has been a group format over the last couple of years. So basically you have two games at this time of year and then you go back after the championship and play your last one and uh, then on to quarterfinals, etc. And in the football, it's the same this year, so there'll be a lot more club activity in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Sun Sport, Mal's Mon upset. Maliki O'Rourke's Monaghan beat uh, Dublin 2-12 to, to 17 points. I appreciate you can say that it was a dead rubber, but that's still a big deal for Monaghan to take a big scalp like that in Crow Park. It's something they haven't really done. I spoke to Maliki O'Rourke after the game and said, yeah, look, I know you've won qualifiers here, but to beat Dublin in a big game in Crow Park, that surely is good for you. He played it down, but I got a sense of yeah, it's actually a very good thing. Dick Clerkin was writing about it today, the former Monaghan footballer, and he said beating Dublin was always one of their aims. And it is a big deal, he said, because Dublin don't do losing. A Cats on to a quinner. Uh, Niall Quinn could be about to make a sensational return to Crisis Club Sunderland. The last time he went there, you know, they... They weren't, as, uh, they weren't as in such a bad state of affairs when he went there last time. They were, they were in pretty poor yeah, shape. But it, it looks certain like they're going to go down to League One. Yeah, and they still have a massive wage bill and they need to sort that out, but it, it doesn't look good. Ireland date for Bruni. Apparently, Ireland are going to play Glasgow Celtic in Scott Brown's testimonial match. And, of course, as well, uh, they have gone with the great escape, uh, referencing Mayo getting the draw against Donegal up in Bally Buffet. 13 points apiece. Aidan O'Shea hailed Mayo steal after the visitors made it out of their Bally Buffet showdown. Uh, with their Division 1 status yep. intact. Uh, it's Mayo leading all those papers. The ones that aren't leading with Mayo, we'll start with the Times Ireland edition. Monaghan make history at Croke Park. That is, of course, that Monaghan story. Maliki are working his first ever win over Dublin in Croke Park yesterday. You talk about the dead rubber, and I do agree with you with everything you say. Uh, it's a huge win for them against Dublin, but it would have been an even bigger win if Stephen Cluxton was playing. Regardless of now, motives, like the, the Cluxton uh, thing, be, beating Cluxton, yeah. Dublin with Cluxton, is the key to any team. That's absolutely true. Evan Comerford played well. I'm not sure there was much he could do about McCarran's second goal to chip. There was certainly nothing he could do about Vinnie Corey's goal, the first goal. It was an absolute blockbuster. Mm. But, but it's a still kick-outs. beating Yeah, but you're still beating Dublin in Crow Park. They still Dublin still did a lot of what they do. I mean, they still had all the opportunities they normally have. They still ran through. They still cut through. There was times they popped points over when maybe they could have gone for goals. I don't understand that. I don't know why they did that because normally they do kill you off with those goals. Yeah. So it's still a big win. I appreciate Cluxton wasn't there, but having seen what I saw at the game, I actually wouldn't take anything away 
from Monaghan's win just because Cluxton wasn't there. Fair, it, is, it is big for them in fairness given what happened to them on so many occasions in championship particularly in quarterfinals against Dublin over the past four or five years. Uh, the back of the Heralds this morning says club tonic that's cool at proving their quality as Shute faces injury blow. Uh, the back of the racing post then uh, it's a couple of different stories I suppose. Yeah, Uruguayans could prove too classy for dragons. It's the China Cup final it's Wales versus no Uruguay. No in the racing post no? Uh, there is this one though. Unsettled Pogba is now 7-4 to four to make a switch to Real Madrid which is very very interesting the market dictating that perhaps Paul Pogba is on the way out of Old Trafford. Then, our two English titles we've got in front of us is uh, potentially one of the stories of the day, actually, one of the stories of the weekend, is Australia's darkest day here. I'll read out the bullet points to you here on the front of the Daily Telegraph. Captain Smith faces a sack after ban for ball tampering in Cape Town. The Prime Minister has condemned his national team as the supporters of abused players and broad hints England had suspicions over rivals' methods during the Ashes. So everybody's doubling down on Australia at the moment after him kind of putting a ball down his pants and uh, kind of producing a different one in one of the I guess it's right up yeah. there with, uh, with, with Don Logue. Well, in cricket, of course, so no. the ref could do nothing. It's like with Don Logue, with the, the Clare ball boy, with, uh, uh, with Babs Keating, you know, and Slitter Skullduggery. Oh, yes. Cr- cricket Soaking the Slitters in water, exactly. switching the Slitters. Yeah, yeah. Cricket has finally caught up with hurling at I re- long. I remember once, actually, I engaged in a bit of Skullduggery, and Owen, it's about time I actually came clean and admitted this. Uh, we were playing up in Rohini, and we were leading by a point and needless to say we had 18 lads on our squad that day so I was never going to get a game I only play when we have you know 14 turning <laughs> up and they're kind of looking and going okay because we have to play 15 if they're here but I, I was umpire uh, umpiring with the Kilbercut <laughs> Crooks top on right now I only learned these skullduggery tricks when I came to Dublin obviously in Ardmore and Waterford were pure. very clean yeah it's pure it's pure right so the ball kind of trickled wide and the ref didn't see and the goalkeeper wasn't looking so I caught the slitter on their puck out and just threw it into the woods. So for about 30 seconds, 40 seconds at the end of the game, they were looking for a slitter, couldn't find one. And they're asking me, where'd it go? Jeez, that's I didn't see it after I caught it and threw it away. <laughs> and one lad saw me and he went in, he started screaming. I was like, dude, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. So listen, I, I actually feel a lot better now um, for admitting that. And I just, I'm, I, I understand the place the Australian cricketers are coming from and why they were forced to do what they did because the pressure gets to you. It does, and apologies to everybody at Rohini for... No, 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 no. I never said I was sorry. I said I wanted to get it out there. But now they know. We won. At uh, the back of the Guardian, then finally, it's time for Smith to go. This is a train wreck for Australian cricket. Its reputation is torched. Uh, it's a great story there. Uh, good on the Aussies for bringing some more life to our sporting lives. Eddie Jones and now the, the uh, Australian cricketers. Uh, we're going to get into football in just a moment. We're going to be joined by Larry Finnerty. If you do want to get in touch with the show, you can tweet us, of course, at Off the Ball, or you can comment on the stream below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook. But here's a clip from yesterday's paper review. If you're a boxing fan or combat sports fan uh, of any note, you'll definitely be interested in yesterday's podcast it was Andy Lee and Kieran Cunningham in the studio and here is Lee chatting about the number of Irish fighters turning pro that will go something, somewhere to something help I issue. talked to both Kenneth Egan and Pete Taylor well, when Pete was allowed to talk to us before the boycott in recent months was the amount of like a huge amount of uh, young Irish or Irish boxers gone pro in the last year or two I think it might have been 34 last year made their debut or something a huge number but but both of them said a lot of them aren't ready. You know, they haven't learned their trade properly and it's a bit dangerous. But you were quite young going pro as well. Were you 20, 21? A lot of the guys who are turning pro now can't cut it as amateurs. Yeah, yeah. They're not top class amateurs and so they have nothing else to do so they're going to turn pro. It's not very dangerous. Like, even the last few months there's been two deaths in the I ring. Know. You know, so it is very dangerous. And uh, at that type of level, that club domestic level of professional boxing, there's hardly any safety measures in place. There's, that, there's yeah. no drug testing, yeah. you know, because there's just not the money to do it. So, it, it, like, I don't know, I see these guys turning pro and people think it's because they're turning pro, they're fighting at a high level. They're not, the, the skill level is way below what, the, what mm-hmm. these top class amateurs are fighting at, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, when you see Kerry Taylor, she, towards the end, when the other countries were catching up with her, the other female competitors were catching up in terms of skill, the fights were cl- very close. But when you see a turn pro, she's she's kind of walking through and having the fights at eight, like especially yeah. in her early fights. I mean, mm. Just because it's on a platform of professional in a big arena, maybe on TV, people think it's a higher standard of boxing, but it's not. 
Yeah, good stuff there from Andy Lee and Kieran Cunningham on yesterday's paper review. Remember, you can subscribe to the Sunday paper review wherever you get your podcasts. And yesterday's one is, of course, available for download this morning. We are going to change uh, attention now to GEA and specifically to yesterday's Gaelic football. Uh, and just to run you down to what actually happened at the weekend and where all the divisions lie, in case you missed anything that happened at the weekend, uh, just to remind you that in Division 4, the final will be contested by Leash and Carlo, who, of course, get promoted up to Division 3. Going in the other direction are Derry and Wexford at Derry Angle there a particularly interesting one while getting promoted from Division 3. Armagh were already up and Fermanagh went up as a result of a controversial late Sean Quigley score against Longford yesterday. Going down then from Division 2, that's the only thing that's still up for grabs as a result of postponed fixtures. Lowther definitely relegated and joining them will be either Meath or Down. Meath are playing Lowther on the last day, which is this weekend, and Down are up against Tipperary. Meath currently one point clear in that situation, so all they need to do is better the result of Down to, to survive in that division. Getting promoted then from Division 2 are Roscommon and Cavan. Uh, Cavan going straight back up, as are Roscommon actually. They're the two sides who went down from Division 1 last year. And then finally in Division 1, the, the final as we already knew before yesterday is going to be contested by Galway and Dublin this coming Sunday and then the big story from the footballing weekend really was regarding the relegation situation Kildare were already doomed to Division 2 before yesterday but the big one was in Bally Buffet as Mayo survived by the skin of their teeth uh, a last minute Kevin McLaughlin equaliser against Donegal to send Donegal down and I'm delighted to say Larry Finnerty joins us on the line this morning Larry has your heart stopped beating after that yesterday it was an incredible kind of finale to a regular season league game and you very very rarely get that in the league. You do, and I suppose with with four minutes to go, it had been a disaster of a league for me. All we were two points down, and yes, you'd have said this has been a total disaster. You couldn't see any positives, and then within the four minutes of extra time, we kicked two great scores, and the whole thing has changed again. You know, so this team, they're unbelievable. They're, I call, I think they're that, they're like the cat with nine lives, and I, I've nearly stopped talking as our uh, uh, counting at this stage. So. I think they certainly used up one of the lives yesterday anyway. Yeah, it's, it seems certainly when you were watching Mayo, and it kind of was a theme throughout the league, that there was a sense of fatigue about them that almost they didn't want to be playing in the league. They were just waiting for the championship to arrive. And then suddenly yesterday, when it really counted, when there was a tangible thing on offer at the end of a league campaign, this championship Mayo exploded and the crowd got louder and louder. And I guess they got a little bit of luck with that Paddy McBriart. He dropped a shot at the end. But ultimately, yeah. there was this male roar, which we didn't, we haven't heard really since Crow Park last year. I suppose that's Mayo for you, and that's they have a huge support and a great support. And they, they, after last week's dismal performance against Tyrone, I suppose it was difficult for everyone to pick themselves up, drag themselves up to Belly Buffet. But fair play to the Mayo crowd; they were up there, and in fairness to the players, they responded at the very, very end. I suppose I feel sorry for Paddy McClure because I think. And I feel sorry for Donegal, unfortunately. But so look, we, we, we can't feel too sorry. But, but Paddy picked up an injury over the last month or so, and I suppose that little bit of fatigue was there in his legs at the very end, uh, and he didn't convert that score, you know, and I suppose we just reaped the benefit. Larry, how important was it, how good was it to see that when Andy Moran was double-marked and kind of cut out of the game by Donegal, other people stepped up? Because that has been an issue for Mayo. It has, and... There's one, there's one problem with Mayo and that we feel that there, there hasn't been enough development of young players and, you know, young players, do they get the chance, do they really get the chance or have they stepped up? Yesterday I thought Conor Loftus, when Andy was, was double marked or when, when Terry Gall had set up the defensive system, uh, free taken obviously is, is a big question. Killian is out. Uh, and there was huge pressure on Conor Loftus' shoulders yesterday. So that was a huge positive for Mayo that Conor Loftus stepped up to the plate, kicked some fantastic scores uh, from both play and freeze particularly, and uh, was one of the highlights. Again, young Owen O'Donoghue was one of the young lads who has, who has stepped up, and we have seen we've, we've got, a, you know, he's just he's a corner back, but we would like to maybe have, have uncovered more players. But again, yesterday, his score uh, was absolutely superb in extra time. For Mayo, at times they kind of played in a way that nearly suited Donny Gall. Do you think once we get to championship and once they're able to work together, we're aware of the logistical problems they suffer with a lot of them living in Dublin. Uh, do you think once we get to championship, they'll be able to employ that hard running style again? And if you run through a defence, if they're set up defensively or if they're set up with a blanket, am I still allowed to use that term around football? If they're set up with a blanket, you can cut through it and it's not as big an issue. Uh, and maybe in the league, they just haven't been able to do that because they haven't worked for it, they haven't prepped for it. But in the championship, they will have worked for it and they will have prepped for it. And we know that against Galway, they'd be playing against a team who do sit deep in numbers. 
they do. And Mayo, Mayo don't seem to play well against against the blanket defence. You know, Tyrone last week was just in Galway, have now have a, have a blanket defence. So I suppose, given yesterday, there are positive signs in, the, in that if Mayo had been relegated yesterday, you couldn't have seen too many positives going into May and going into that big Galway game. Now you can think, you can feel, yes, we certainly, I still think we're a month behind in our training. I think there isn't a whole lot of jizz around the middle of the field because I, I do think you have to attack, you know, the, the blanket at pace. I thought we were very one-paced, particularly around the middle of the field yesterday. Two O'Shea's, Tom Parsons, they, they, there was no real power in, in the legs yet. You'd hope that over the next month that that little bit of, of, of championship uh, power and pace is going to come into the team. It took took it a long time to happen last year. You know, it didn't really happen to the Roscommon replay, the, the quarter final, and then we saw what we were capable of. You'd be hoping this year that it'll have to happen a little bit sooner. That they're going to have to hit the ground running against Galway, and particularly, you know, if they if they were, hap, did happen to lose that game, you know, they 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 will want to be in the Super Eights, obviously. And, you know, there could be a few. It could be a minefield to the back door again. So you'd be hoping that they have that space now in the next few weeks to have the pressure off. Um, whereas the league wasn't wasn't great. There is a few positives, you know, uh, signs from yesterday, and that it's something that they can work on over the next month. But Larry, when you look back at Mayo's league campaign, they only beat two teams. They beat Monaghan, who were without Conor McManus that day. They beat Kildare, and everybody beat Kildare. Yesterday, they brought Alan Freeman and Barry Moran off the bench. Do you not think Mayo are in a small bit of trouble here, where there's actual tangible things here uh, in front of us that we've seen in this league campaign that we haven't seen in the last 21 years of Mayo's long-running standing in Division 1? Well, there's no doubt about it. If the game, if the game was live, if they, if they didn't get the result yesterday, we would be saying, we'd be talking today about the absolute pure disaster, and we'd have been saying it is. And maybe we're papering over over some cracks by by those two great scores yesterday. Uh, there are problems. We're, we say it every year. Well, if we have we have so many all stars missing, we're looking for Chris Barrett to come back. Uh, we're, we're looking for Keith Higgins, Harris. You know, we're looking for all these lads. It's nearly the same every year. You know, you're hoping these lads. You, you know, there hasn't been a whole whole lot of new stuff. Lee Keegan is injured. It's a major worry. Do you know what I mean? How long? When is Lee coming back? You know, it, there's always ifs and buts, buts about this Mayo team. We haven't uncovered a whole pile of extra players, you know, like Galway and Dublin, a few of these teams who seem to have been able to bring in a lot of new lads. We don't have the playing resources of other counties. Even Monaghan, I think, in the last few weeks in Tyrone, have really, really stepped up. So the season, the league has been a disaster. Everybody got points off Kildare. We caught Monaghan early. And then apart from that, it has been a disaster bar four minutes of extra time yesterday. So... We might be tapering over cracks here, but there is a few positive signs there at the same time because they'll have to be grasping at a few positives over the next few weeks in order to get ready for the for the championship. Colm O'Rourke in the Sunday Independent yesterday floated the idea of potentially playing Paddy Durkin as a forward in the championship. So there's a two, two-part question to this. A, do you agree with that idea? And B, does that not sum up the general malaise in Mayo's forwards that Colm O'Rourke is suggesting playing one of your finest backs in the front six? It is, and I think, you know, we were suggesting Keith Higgins was up there last year, or uh, not last year, in the last few years, and there's a lot of suggestions about that. The, the fact of the matter is that we don't have, you know, apart from Andy having a super year last year and Jason Darty coming good for a while, we don't have, you know, any any great scoring forwards. Now, the positive from yesterday is that, you know, Conor Loftus played quite well as a half-forward. And maybe half forward is his position. We've been playing inside, so maybe we have uncovered a half forward last year. I still think that Mayo's, you know, is their best opportunities uh, from scoring points of view is having the likes of Lee Keegan and Paddy Durkin and these players, Colin Boy bombing from the half back line at pace. Uh, that's where I would be leaving those lads because that's I think where we're most dangerous is coming from deep. Uh, we have unearthed Connor Loftus now. I'd leave him there. So now we've got a half, another half forward option. So hopefully, Kevin McLaughlin, excellent again yesterday. Jeremy O'Connor, we're still, you know, we're still not getting probably enough yet out of Jeremy. But Jeremy is going to be in the team. He's, he's a very strong runner. You're hoping Jeremy will come good. And he put Connor Loftus in there to the half forward line. 
and possibly with Aidan Floating, whatever. Maybe we'll be okay in that department. Larry, an unoriginal question, but maybe one that still hasn't been answered. Aidan O'Shea, where is his best position for Mayo? Where do you put him? <sighs> sure, it's, 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 that's the, that's, that's the, the conundrum. Um, you know, where, where, where do you put him? From full back to full forward, you, you know, right up the middle. Somewhere winning ball and dishing it off. Winning ball, sort of putting his, making his presence felt, giving is, is, early is ball. There an answer? Is there one answer to that question? Because, like you say, if you're playing against Galway, you're playing against a very defensive team who sit deep. Then if you're playing against the likes of Dublin, they set up differently. So is it a case that there is no real answer? It's per game. That's your answer. It probably is. Now, I thought last year, even in the All-Ireland final, OK, maybe he did run out of steam in the last 10 minutes, but for 50 minutes, and he had a phenomenal year last year. And he, has, he probably has been our best player in the league so far. Uh, you, need, you need to be able to win primary ball. I thought we were poor again yesterday winning primary ball around the middle of the field. I thought there was no real... For a team that's as experienced as Mio, there didn't seem to be any real, uh, we'll say, you know... A, on the break strategy, Danny Gall seemed to pick up. We broke ball, but we didn't even, you know. So I, I do think we need looking at it, and I, unless that the two boys, both Seamus and Tom, are still, I think, a month behind in regards to training. Edo has to probably be around the middle of the field at this point in time. I'm not sure about him playing inside at full forward. We tried that, Andy, you know. But if Andy is double, if, if Andy is doubled up, you know, on Galway. Do we need, maybe we might need to play him, do something different uh, against Galway and maybe play him inside and, you know, get the ball in over the, over the defensive system and hope that he can, can, can beat Sean Andy in the air, you know. So, because it's, I'm not, I'm, that's why I'm not managing the Mayo team, I suppose. It's, it's, it's a headache, isn't it? Just one last thing on the specifics of yesterday's game, Larry. What would you have done if you had the ball in your hand and you were Paddy McBriarty in that position? Look, I'm, I certainly was never a Paddy McBriarty. I think I just think that poor Paddy. I feel sorry for him because he's such a brilliant forward, and I think that he has been. And I think just that Paddy, possibly Paddy could have played for the free and and won his free. You know, held on to it that little bit longer. But when you're Paddy McBriarty, you do fancy yourself. I, it, I, I think that the ball, maybe possibly, uh, Caelan Crowe was not going to may have got a touch on it. You know, it was just one of those things. On another day, Paddy would have kicked that ball over the bar, but. You have to think Paddy is just coming back from a month's layoff. If Paddy had that month in his legs, that ball would have gone over the bar and we'd have been talking, we'd have, we'd have been singing a different show this morning, you know? Larry, I guess to win, you have to do what you have to do. We saw that with Dublin at the end of last year's All-Ireland Final. That's not me criticising them, that is me observing them. Would you be happy enough and maybe even kind of secretly glad that Mayo did what they had to do after the final or just before the final kick-out Yesterday, they grabbed, they held, they held up the play, they, they did what they needed to do to get the result. I think that was great. I, I, I've been looking at that as a positive sign. I haven't, haven't watched Dublin do it in the All-Ireland final last year. I haven't, haven't watched them last week against Galway when they got the lead score. The same thing happened again. Uh, and Dublin seemed to be able to get away with it, no problem. All of a sudden, they all try it, uh, haven't, haven't it happened to them try and kill the game. It, there doesn't seem to be any great issues from Dublin do it. All of a sudden, they are the bad guys. Uh, you know, you, you've got to learn from the best. And uh, Dublin seemed to be absolutely brilliant at wrapping lads up in the last seconds of the game. I thought they were excellent in regards to what they did, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, the game was there. They had got the, they had got the point. So you, you've got to try and kill it, you know. And... Uh, in fairness to the referee, I thought it was a good call because I thought, I thought Donegal had been play-acting a little bit themselves and I know they felt aggrieved after the game that the rest blew it early, but they themselves were killing the clock. You know, this is the same thing when Mio were probably frustrated a point behind and they see Donegal totally killing the clock in, the, in four minutes. You know, so frustrations will 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 get in. But look, Mio, if, 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 if you're learning, if you're up there scrapping with the dubs, uh, it's about time that Mio showed a little bit of those scrapping signs, particularly in, in the closing stages of a huge game, you know, so... I say fair play to them yesterday. Yeah, and so that's one element that they might have taken from the dubs, that kind of wholesale pulling down of the player at a kick-out when they have the game or the result they needed in the bag. What else could you take from Dublin or potentially from the new hard-edged Galway side that they could implement on May 13th? What, what other things would you like to see uh, in terms of that dark arts and the, the, the stuff that they might be able to implement? Well, 
Uh, look, it's, it's probably... <laughs> we know in the last couple of years there has been so little between Mayo and, and Dublin. Uh, kicking those frees, kicking those scores, at, you know, when, when they present themselves, is huge. You have to convert all, particularly against Dublin and Ireland final if you're, if you're close to them. And then you've got to probably have a strategy if you are in the lead uh, with, the, with a minute to go on the clock that... Yes, you have you have a clear in your head in this. We know what we have to do. Like Dublin seems to be seem to be you know experts at this. They got the lead and straight away they had a plan. We're going to kill this. We're going to kill the game, uh, and that's something you can learn from the Dubs. It's a difference. It has been the difference with Dublin and Mayo over the last couple of All Irelands. Uh, a minute to go, the, the the game is in the melting pot, and Dublin have been able to, you know. But Mayo have had the experience of being there. They play well in Cork Park. And they showed their experience yesterday. Like they had had a terrible league, but with four minutes to go, and for Kevin McLaughlin again to step up to the plate and kick it off was right for yesterday from forty yards, like unbelievable score. So that's something that Mayo can take away. We are, they are a fantastic team. Now they have maybe picked up a few a few tricks, uh, and 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 maybe they, they certainly need, you need every trick in the book to be Dublin in All Ireland final, as far as I can see. You know so. Mm. Maybe maybe this might help, and maybe it might help Galway. Now, I thought Galway were excellent again last Sunday instead of standing up to the dubs. Possibly if that was Mio, you'd have said they wouldn't have got the score. So it was a huge, and it goes, it's a huge boost for the for Galway going into the league final next Sunday, which everybody will be looking forward to now. You know, So there was a right good edge to that game with Dublin. So uh, Maybe Dublin are slipping a little bit too, so... Well, we, uh, we give Galway a chance for next Sunday. We might just actually finish up on that then, Larry, about Galway-Dublin this Sunday. Like, it seems to me that there's been a lot of comparisons between this Galway side and the Ross Common side of 2016, aside from Connacht, kind of relatively coming from nowhere after getting promoted straight away and flying early in the league. But I think we sometimes forget that Ross Common lost their last three games of that league campaign it and is. got hockeyed by Kerry in the league semi-final. <clears throat> it doesn't seem that Galway are going to trail off as dramatically. No, uh, Roscommon blew out that year. You know they had trained hard early. They got their points on the board, and then they just blew out. And there was the signs that Roscommon had blown out were there coming up to the league semi final. Leo had gone up to Roscommon and beaten them. Galway have not. Galway are a much different team. The age profile is different. They have got a lot of older lads. This system has been. Kevin is working with this team for three or four years now, so the system has been fine tuned over the years. All. Galway are lacking, and I suppose going into Coke Park again, but they have, I think they've gained a lot of confidence, and I don't think Galway are going to be going away and are going to be just blown out like Wisconsin did. I think Galway could be a force going forward into the championship and possibly into the next few years. So we'll see. I think it's setting up what's potentially a great league final because there was a right bit of buys in Pear Stadium last week, and I think that will be carried in. There's no love lost between the two 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 teams. Um, Galway are, are, are have strengthened up. They bullied Mayo as well as beat them, which was a big, big, big game for them. And uh, we have seen a consistency in their play over the league. So I'm looking, really looking forward to this game next Sunday. And it'll tell a lot of tales. It'll tell of where Galway are at, I suppose. And uh, looking forward to it anyway. Larry, you live and work in Galway. You're a former Galway county medalist yourself. Have you ever known such positivity uh, in Galway? Well, or is it the most positive it's been since kind of that 98 to 2001 region? It is. Um, Galway are, all, are positive, even though they're, they're not, as, uh, they're not as, as, we'll say, as, as fanatical as Mayo. They, but they still always have that confidence and you always feel that Galway can turn it fairly quickly when it happens. And, you know, you could see people in Galway have been saying the last years Galway could win an All-Ireland before Mayo do, and then all of a sudden this... So they don't, but I think they're quietly confident. I think people are sort of pinching themselves. Nobody was had much expectations in Galway of this uh, Kevin Walsh revolution, and now all of a sudden it seems to be real. So... Um, they're, they're quietly getting around to it. Uh, so it's obviously... You know, you're going to have a very exciting uh, league final next week. Hopefully, they'll stand up and, and, and do well. And then you're going to have a fantastic four or five weeks preparation for Mayo because I think everybody wants to get to Castlebar uh, 13th of May. Yeah, it's uh, certainly the, the biggest stage in the early season of the championship this year. We cannot wait for it. Larry Finnerty, thanks very much for your time this morning. Mighty stuff. Thanks a million.
Cheers to that now, Larry. We're going to change to soccer now. Uh, we're going to review Turkey versus Ireland, which occurred on Friday. Turkey obviously beating Ireland 1-0. Just for something completely different uh, for the time being, though, Richard Cooper was in over the weekend as that pre-match's 20th birthday approaches. And tell me, have you recovered from uh, Matt Williams, being in the studio with Matt Williams? I am more than recovered. Matt Williams was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. One of the things about Matt I've noticed <laughs> is that he has no, Joe, he has no lips he has no lips and also his hands are tiny and also another thing I noticed particularly during this Six Nations mate is that he has to have let me tell you he has to have a nickname for everybody even people whose family don't call him this name he calls him that name Tiger Furlong nobody else calls him Tiger you know, it would be Furly or Furlongy or something else but it's Tiger uh, Gordy Darcy, Jeno, Shaney. I think mean, he couldn't really have a nickname for you, could he? He couldn't it's really. Tougher. Joey, not really. Um, it felt but like also a everything when is. Call me Joe. In, some way, in some ways, it felt like a nickname when he would call me Joe. <laughs> yeah, Joe. Uh, Richard Cooper there of Apre Match. You can catch the podcast that as well on all uh, of our podcast applications, iTunes or whatever you, you tend to use. Uh, but as I say, it is time to turn to Turkey versus the Republic of Ireland, which happened on Friday. And Dan MacDonald, I understand you're back in Dublin. Welcome home. Thank you, Owen. I was reading your column this morning. There's no Wikipedia in Turkey. No, no, they've, they've blocked it. Just in case you know, people there can find out, I don't know, things about the world that might have happened in their, <laughs> in their region or things about Turkey, sorry, that might have happened in their region. Or there, is some, uh, there is some logic behind it, I guess, that probably would be a cynical logic and uh, not a very healthy one for uh, Turkey's, <laughs> Turkey's yeah. recent checkered history, shall we say, in the area of uh, press freedom or, or general free speech. Dan, isn't it great, though, that you don't often come across an organisation who don't enjoy freedom of the press or try to control the press? I, I don't know what you're possibly referring to, Oshin. <laughs> we leave it there. I don't know so. what you're possibly referring to. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned a lot from your column actually this morning about uh, Turkish privacy laws. But in terms of what we learned about the Republic of Ireland football team at the weekend, we saw a lot of new faces, but we didn't really see a completely new style of play. And all this hope of a brand new era, well, that hope was completely misplaced. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think maybe in time, in a strange way, I mean, I sort of mentioned in the piece today that you might view the week as significant in terms of like integrating new faces and, and, and Declan Rice in particular. But, um, uh, you know, I, I always felt before the game that while there was a sense of a new chapter sort of personnel wise, it was a bit optimistic to think that it was suddenly going to represent some kind of uh, revolution, I suppose, pardon the reference to previous uh, discussions that, that you know that we would see some sort of huge sort of regime change in terms of how Ireland played um, you know that that's that's something that has to evolve over a period of time uh, with a particular type of player um, and I, I guess you know you could argue as well that uh, and it's a fair point that I mean we, we know what to expect from this manager really in terms of how his teams are going to play and his philosophy is about results rather than necessarily I don't know, developing a clear style, he would argue that he doesn't have the time to do that within two to three days anyway. Um, but when we are at the same time, you know, what, sort of five years almost, I think, into uh, his time in charge. And, you know, you're not going to be hugely entertained by the games and you can change the, the personnel or you can, you can change the system. But ultimately, um, there's still a team that often is going to let the other side have the ball. I and mean, he did say before the game, you know, that, well, there's not much to change about how Ireland have played away from home in the last campaign. And to a point, if you go to results-based argument, that's probably fair enough. And that, you know, he wants to see Ireland play better at home. But you would think that, you know, uh, the, the route to success at home is probably controlling the ball a bit more. And it's certainly something we didn't see Ireland do on Friday. No, we, we should chat a little bit about Declan Rice and Stephen Hunt in yesterday's Sunday Independent was making the interesting point that in his position it's unusual that he should be wearing the number 10. It's almost like one Rude Hullet who Declan Rice of course wouldn't remember but he will be interested in seeing Rice playing in that central role, that sweeper role that Hullet so famously played in the number 10 jersey. Yeah, and uh, it's certainly he brings something to that position that maybe Ireland don't necessarily have which is that bit of composure and uh, the ability to and you know, I sort of watched it back yesterday, even that last 25 minutes or so, where he was in midfield. That 
just to bring the play up, you know, 10, 15 yards by, you know, holding on to the ball, you know, executing one or two little passes or one twos or something, just something to 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 get Ireland out of the the hole that they tend to be dug into permanently sometimes. And while it may well be that his best position in the context of of Premier League football might well be at, at centre half, you know, you you, you have. Uh, you know, you have to judge the personnel as you see it. And um, okay, that midfield on Friday say won't be an Irish midfield. You'd imagine in a in a competitive game too often. Um, but you, you could see how a, a Rice and a Hendrick and maybe a Robbie Brady in a midfield three or something, just to, to, to pick three names, um, could be suited. And and often has been suited in the past by having that type of player, even the sort of much maligned James McCarthy in the Euros, like when he had his better games, he sort of gave that role to the side and allowed Hendrick and, and Brady and others to play around them. And I think Rice can certainly do that. I think that, you know, you, you, you couldn't fail but to be encouraged by, by his display on, on Friday. But I think as, as Seamus Coleman said afterwards, you know, others should have taken a leaf out of his book and he looked more composed and advanced and developed than guys, you know, in their mid-20s. But I guess at the same time, those guys in their mid-20s, in some cases, have never played in the Premier League and Declan Rice already has. So maybe maybe we shouldn't be so, so surprised that quality ultimately shines true. Listening to Kevin Kilban and Gary Breen on Off the Ball over the weekend, or Keith Andrews, I beg your pardon, they were talking about Jeff Hendrick and they were saying that he hasn't hit the heights that he did at the Euros. I do understand what they're saying, but I do think maybe it's a little bit unfair in him because the way we set up, the way we play... Surely that doesn't get the best out of a player like Jeff Hendrick. Yeah, I, I just think it's a case of where to play a machine. I don't think that's really been figured out. I mean, you know, if you look over the course of the last year, there's been times he's played as that, that number 10, if you want to call it that, uh, in the more traditional sense of the number 10 shirt, where you're sort of the uh, you know attacking central midfielder. There's times he's sort of loosely playing off the right in a diamond or or even in a sort of that 4-2-3-1 or, or, or whoever you want to describe that that setup with the with the lone striker. Um, and never never really seemed entirely comfortable and, and, and never really at home. Although he, he has sometimes played in that sort of 10, that position at Burnley, um, the way Ireland play, you know, the ball's gone over his head. He's he's almost got the, the back to goal sometimes and, and, and doesn't really seem to be entirely comfortable. I, I would say the way Ireland set up on, on Friday, you would think if that position suited, it, you know, if, if the formation was working, it should suit him in a way because you get Hendrick sort of driving on with the ball at his feet. As we saw at the Euros, a lot of it was Hendrick with the game ahead of him, you know, sort of gracefully sort of stepping forward and, and, and really taking the game to opponents and, and looking at home. That's what Rice was almost doing when he, when he was in that position. And, and I think uh, Martin O'Neill even specifically made that point afterwards that he wants players to have the control, uh, the confidence to take the ball, to drive ahead, uh, with the ball at their feet and 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 bring the game 10 15 yards forward. Hendrick can't do that. Didn't necessarily do it on the game in the game on Friday. Um, but I personally feel, for what it's worth, you know, certainly a slightly deeper position. I think suits him with the game ahead of him a bit more. But maybe it's because of his physicality. Maybe it's because um, of the other personnel that he's had that that Martin O'Neill has tried him further forward and he's just looked a bit lost. And I think Hendrick has probably acknowledged himself that. His performances could just have been better too, that he just hasn't played as well as he can. An interesting observation from Kevin Kilban is that, you know, he's watched this team over the last five, six years and he's noticed that when they don't pass to a man who's on or they don't make the right play, there's no kind of screaming and shouting, there's no barking at each other. Now, he was saying that that can actually be a negative because when there's no consequences, maybe you're not as, I won't say motivated, but you, if you've no fear of making a mistake, maybe that's a bad thing. Is that something you've noticed? Do you think that maybe now Seamus Coleman is back in, there'd be a bit more kind of barking and screaming and getting guys to take it on, or is that an issue? Yeah, I think you, you definitely, you do sometimes wonder, um, you know, where are the real leaders in that group? And then you have the natural changeover from one era to the next, and you would hope that people naturally become more confident. There was something you'd look out for a bit on Friday with the new system, um, because you're all, always wondering, you know, and this is obviously a criticism of the O'Neill era, you know, how much preparation had there been with this particular setup? You know, they'd had three days training, they'd have a few 11 v 11 or 12 v 11 matches that we were in. They weren't necessarily trying out this uh, this shape. Now, they may have done it separately, but they weren't doing it certainly when 
when when we were there and, and, and not necessarily with all the personnel together. So you think, well, who's talking and who's barking away? And to be fair, you do have someone like Shane Duffy, who is quite a vocal player, who's become probably a senior member of the group in the last year. Rice himself, I think O'Neill points out, um, he's not shy uh, about having a word. But, the, you know, you, you maybe did look at midfield between Hurrahan and Hendrick and, and Brown, and you're like, well, who's taking control here? And who is the that dominant figure? And I, I guess if you you feel that someone like Rice has been, uh, he's been a captain all the way up, uh, or quite often for his respective clubs, that maybe there's a certain logic in, in moving him into that midfield area if you're short of that type of character there. Uh, lastly then, Dan, just from being around the camp over the last week or so, what's the mood of Martin O'Neill been like? You know, obviously he was tetchy with Tony O'Donoghue in particular over the last couple of months, and that's not to say he was tetchy around the rest of the media, but like, did, did he seem like he was of a sunnier disposition over the last week? Uh, I, I, I think so. I don't think there was any real issues to discuss. I think, I, I don't know, I wouldn't read too much into it, but the fact that they, they threw training open a couple of days, they let people come in and watch it, uh, when generally our access over training is pretty poor. Uh, now, maybe that's because there was a smaller group there. And let's be honest, it was a low in, low intensity game in terms of sort of pressure on the outcome. Um, th- there was soundings around January, February time when all that sort of fuss was kicking off that O'Neill maybe privately was a bit aware that you know the, 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 the Sarah relations weren't necessarily helping uh, anybody and, and maybe there was a step towards that but it, it, sometimes it can be it has been hot and go, cold across um, his time I mean sometimes he's very accommodating and in great form and uh, it's well known and you speak to people who who've worked with him that you know generally in a really big match week um, O'Neill just in his own personality, just gets a bit more intense as the game approaches. And sometimes we overanalyze the whole media thing, but it's just generally how he is anyway. And um, that he can, he can, you know, switch on that bit more and, and, and want to do things in a particular way. A week in Turkey, really, for a game where the result didn't matter, yeah, it was pretty chilled out. But I'm not sure if that's necessarily indicative of anything going forward. Mm. Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, lads. Dan McDonald there, as I say, of the Irish Independent. You are watching OTBAM, which is brought to you this morning with AIR, the home of AIR Sport. Get amazing live sporting content free with AIR Broadband. Now, it is competition time and the off-the-ball Golf Weekly Masters Preview Day is back once again this year after last year's roaring success. Once again, we're warming up for the opening major of the year at Luttrell's Town Castle Golf Club in Dublin on Wednesday, April 4th. That's Wednesday week. The day will include 18 holes of golf at Luttrell's Town Golf Club, followed by food and the live off-the-ball Masters preview show in the clubhouse with some of Ireland's top golfers. Everyone who enters will be put into the draw for a year's membership at Luttrellstown. All this week on OTBAM, we're giving you the chance to come along to the show and every day we're also giving away two two balls so you can bring along a friend. To enter, all you've got to do is tag the mate you'd bring along in the comments below or if you're watching on Twitter, just tag them in a reply to the stream on Periscope. We'll announce the winner at the end of the show and there will be more chances to win over the coming days on Off The Ball and OTBAM. As I said at the top of the show, we're going to get some proper hurling analysis in a moment from Dahi Regan. But in the meantime, here is Ushin Goff speaking after Carlo's win in Division 2A and getting promotion to 1B at the weekend. Well, here with Ushin Goff, cooler cornerback. Ushin, how does it feel to have achieved a two in a row? Oh, it's, a, it's an incredible feeling. And there was times in the game, I think, it was a bit up and down. Like, we got the two goals and then the Pierce fair play to them. They came right back and I think they went to point up. So, it was only a couple of minutes to go and fair play to our lads for digging it out. It was an incredible performance by uh, the lads. What was said at halftime, you were one point up. But I think it's fair to say that you weren't playing particularly well now. Neither were they. You knew there was more in both. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was a bit of back and forth. We were both feeling each other out. And then I think at halftime, let's just stick to the process. Let's just try to stick to our game plan. But we knew the fight would come, you know. So when we got the two goals, and I think there was 20 minutes left, I, I knew there was a kick in the piercing, and I knew they'd come back into it. So fair play to the piercing. They, they didn't give up right to the final whistle, but uh, just delighted to get over the line. What was the difference in that last maybe four minutes? Because you got three points in a row to seal it. And... You know, that's, that's tough to do when you're fatigued, when, when every ball is there to be fought for and the Pierce aren't giving up either. Yeah, I think that they were putting us under massive pressure at the back and they were launching ball in. And you have lads like Sean Warren, who's an incredible hurler, Darrell O'Connell, these, Keno Callan, these lads coming out with balls, you know, and just that never say die attitude. And lads just worked right to the final whistle. So it was just never give up, fight for every single ball, and that's what the lads did. 
it was always just if we stuck to the process hopefully get over the line because we knew the Pearson were an incredible team and they were look they were unlucky the first day you know a couple of calls could have went their way you know so that's just the way it is tight hard fought battle between two of the, the biggest teams in Ireland and it's just brilliant to get out with the win well done Oshie cheers thanks very much cheers well done Thank you. Play to you. That is Oshin Langan speaking to Oshin Goff of Kula at the weekend after their win against the Pierce Chicken, the All Ireland Club final replay. An unbelievable. It, well, it, it is completely. You're my fault. a footballing man. It's not your fault. Yeah, As I say, us hurling people feel sorry for those involved the, in other sports. The, the we don't, we don't uh, not like you. Tone right there. We will hear from Carlo a little bit later on if you're a little bit disappointed uh, by that showing from Kula right there. But something we can't be disappointed in was those two games, which was probably the best two games of hurling. Okay, I'm not going to say in all hurling, but certainly in club, it blows everything out of the water. It was unbelievable. No, I think you were right in your original comment that it was one of the best games ever, let alone club games ever. The intensity was ferocious, the skill was absolutely supreme. The second game better than the first, probably for two reasons. One, there was a bit of tension around the first game because it was the All-Ireland Final, it was Croke Park, there was a bit of a gap between games for both teams. And it was just bloody freezing. It's hard to play hurling in really cold conditions. Uh, on Saturday, it was more like championship. The ground was that bit harder. The temperature was that bit nicer. They probably benefited from the game and they didn't have a week of training. They just relaxed into it. And they just kind of cut loose. Now, obviously, you know, there was tactics and all that. But it was just, right, we're going to throw our best at you and you're going to throw your best at us. And it was just <coughs> phenomenal. And there was little switches here and there. And, you know, I've watched it back since. Having been at the game, I'd like to watch it back again. It was that good. Um, but look, certainly, it was one of the most memorable occasions I can remember. And it was added to by Carlo doing what they did in the game before. Now, they did it with a good margin, but the celebrations by the Carlo players on the pitch were, I won't say wild, but you could sense the joy. You could sense that kind of, that desperation to achieve what they had achieved. And it was the same then with Kula, even though it was very different because they just captured their second All-Ireland title in a row. But you could tell what it meant to them because they wanted to back up last year. They didn't just want to be a one-season wonder. And I know that sounds harsh, calling any team that wins an All-Ireland a one-season wonder. But the carrot was there for them to step up to the Portumnas and the Burrs and the Sarsfields and the Athen Rise. Yeah. And they certainly, certainly have. Yeah, like we've we'll got Dahi Regan on the line uh, in a moment to chat about it. But you might just pass me over the Irish Examiner there uh, if you have it. Because Anthony Daly kind of sums up beautifully how important it is. That's the Irish Times. Uh, Irish Examiner, sorry. Uh, he sums up beautifully how important it really is for Bat Gilroy to actually br uh, bring um, these guys into play. So I think he's midway through it. If you are picking up a copy of the Examiner this morning, Daly is always worth a read. Uh, and just in, in terms of what Gilroy needs to do now. It was actually Daly, uh, Anthony, I was talking to you yesterday. He was working for uh, Radio 1 yesterday doing a co-commentary and I just got chatting to him before the game. I was trying to convince him to call me up to the Croke senior team because he's, <laughs> he's the manager now. Uh, that was unsuccessful, but what was successful was the chat about Kula and some of the players. And when, when, I, when he said it was one of the best hurling games he's ever seen, I thought to myself, OK, yeah. whatever about what I think, who cares what I think? But Dalo has said it, that's enough for me. Well, I think I'll actually come back to this quote in just a moment because we will talk about Dublin and we will talk about the importance of Kula to the Dublin cause in just a moment. But first of all, Dahi Regan, a very good morning to you. How good was that All-Ireland final replay on Saturday afternoon? Ah, it's one of, the, one of the best club finals without a shadow of a doubt. Fantastic. Two brilliant club sides. I mean, you just look at the record the last three years between them, they've shared it. Considering how many brilliant clubs there are in the country, that's really unique. I mean, you've got to, you've got to win so many games your own county championship your provincial championship so it was two magnificent teams going at it and at the end of you know whatever it was 120 140 160 minutes it there was very very little to separate them and uh thoroughly enjoyable everyone you spoke to it was a, it was just a talk of the place you know the quality the standard of hurling and it's if, if you look at even the likes of henry shefflin i've been asked about the highlight of his career winning winning with bally hale you know, I, I know the greatest day I ever had in the hurling field was was with Bor in '98, our second final. Just just happens to stick out, and it's it's just magnificent what it does. But the the type of hurling, the quality of hurling, you know, it's why there's a place for the club, the club players association, because these guys are up to the fitness levels of inter county players. It was an extraordinary game of hurling. And it was a real, real pity someone had to lose. But that sport, and it's why sport is fantastic, and yet. Kula go at it in a couple of weeks' time again in the club championship. Extraordinary level. Uh, Matty Kenny 
and his management team um, just absolutely fantastic. An extraordinary game of hurling, O'Sheen. And I know you were there and you interviewed some of the boys afterwards. An extraordinary game of hurling from, from club players. Dahi, it might seem like a silly question, but what made it such a great game? Uh, especially comparing it to the first game, which was a good enough game, but the second game was outstanding. It was outstanding and the quality of hurling was better. I mean, I looked at the first game and I read a lot of reports afterwards and I read a lot of comments afterwards about how fantastic it was. And I spoke to some people at the Offaly game, Kilkenny game last week and I said, I don't buy that. I actually thought the intensity was exactly what everyone had said it was, but the quality wasn't there. And why, why was it like that? Because when you get committed bunch of sports people and the end goal is this winning. It's not the climb in the steps. It's that that's that's kind of immaterial. That's the, they're the ribbons that's attached afterwards. It's just you get into this bubble. You get into this zone where the most important thing in your life, you're consumed by this thing, and uh, you just had a group of players on both sides who the end goal meant that you were going to go to war and you were willing to do what it took and you were willing to do extraordinary things and you had 30 guys willing to do extraordinary things. And that's that's why we had what we had the weekend. So credit to, to everybody, to both sides. Well done to Kula, but credit to both sides. And we're seeing a picture of Shane Stapleton who's never shy in coming forward, but genuinely delighted for the guy. He's a good guy, he deserves of course. it. Um, yeah. After the game, I spoke to Sean Moore in the Kula centre-back and he said this week we were going to play it on our terms. Last week maybe we played it on the Piershig's terms. Would you agree with that? And can you explain to us how they set out their terms, how they kind of set the tone? Yeah, I think it's a fair point. Because if you look at Kula in every single game to date, it was always played on their terms. If you look at the Leinster final or, or the, 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 the Kilcormick game, very much played on their terms. Wing forwards withdrawn, huge space left inside for Callaghan and, and Kilcormick kind of acquiesced. And it was certainly played on their terms. The puck out strategy, they always found, you know, willing to go short. And KK sat back and allowed them to build. Napiershik looked at the way Kula play and they like space. And Matty Kenny's a Galway man and it's a specific Galway way of playing in many respects. Huge space in front of the inside too. Uh, wing forwards coming very deep. Played on their terms. Clearly last week, Napiershik decided, well, under no circumstances is that going to happen. We're just going to crowd every Kula player that gets a ball. He was suffocated. And it was quite clear that they weren't allowed to play the way they wanted to. So they deserve great credit for hanging in and being able to get themselves a draw. So they sat down, they digested what had happened, and they decided, right, Napiershik came at us. And they came at us with a force that we'd not met yet. We weren't prepared for it. We struggled with it. Okay, Saturday, you know, more Park, what we're going to do is we're going to meet that head on. We're not going to lose any of the physical exchanges. And outside of that, then, we've still got to be able to try and play the brand of Ireland. That's fine for them to say in team meetings. But when you go out on the pitch, it wasn't that in the pier sheet we're going to drop in any way to level it or intensity. And did Kula bring any more intensity than it did the week beforehand? You know, you can reflect on games and say, and the immediate aftermath and say, well, we did this different, we did that different. Ultimately, it was a dogfight to the very end. They could have lost it just as easily. But I think what they did do was they openly recognised that Napiershik brought a massive intensity that maybe, maybe the previous week took them by surprise. They were ready for it last weekend and it was just a shootout. It was enthralling stuff, yeah, enthralling stuff. Talk to us a little bit, Dahi, about just how huge an achievement it is to do back-to-back -back All-Ireland club titles. Like, they're only the fifth club to do it and the only other club not from Galway to have done back-to-back -back All-Irelands is Burr. So you'd have a great insight into how tough this is. Obviously, your success in the 90s would have had a precipitative kind of impact on 02 and 03, I think it was, when Burr did back-to-back All-Ireland. So talk to us a little bit about how tough it was for Kula and indeed the legacy that could now come as a result of these two successes. Well, one, it's the legacy that they'll create within their own club. Two, it's what Dublin need to, f to feed off again. Dublin need to feed off of this. There needs to be a return for, to Dublin hurling from this. And that means, I hear question marks, if the Kula players and if they all return. Why wouldn't they? You know, when we finished with Burr over the years, we just couldn't wait to get back in with Offaly. We couldn't wait. We, we always took our week and maybe two off, which Eamon Cregan didn't always necessarily like the second week off. But you couldn't wait. And the other club players with Offaly loved when you came back. So, number one, they have a responsibility, not just to Kula. They have a responsibility to Dublin Hurling 
to come back in with your Gilroy and add to this thing in relation to why it's so difficult. Dublin Senior Hurling Championship is notoriously hard won, as is Galway, as is Tip, as is Cork, as is Kilkenny in particular, I would suggest. So to do that, coming from, let's face it, a base not so long ago, and I played against Kula many years ago when I hurled with Fogs. I mean, you, one man and his dog will go and look at them playing hurling. So to create the dynamic within their club of this support base and the underage structures and the way they've harnessed all this underage structure. So they've won a very, very demanding Dublin title. To go on then, I mean, they pretty much blew everyone in Leinster away. But it's keeping the appetite. It's the key. Let's face it, you start training kind of at the start of the year and it's 12 months and then it's into March. You're talking about 15 months. So this is 30 months that Kula are at what they're at. Not losing a game in the provincial championship, maybe losing in Dublin, but getting in, you know, in the secondary. So it's literally two and a half years to keep this winning mentality going for a club team is an extraordinary feat and it's why so few have done it. Dahi, when you look at the Kula players, they're going back into a Dublin team that are maybe a bit low in confidence and who are looking at a relegation battle potentially from the Liam McCarthy to the Joe McDonough. So how difficult is that going to be for the players? I mean, when you went from Burr to Offaly, you were going into a team who were in All-Ireland contention. So that's, that's very difficult. So tell, tell us about the difficulties you see there and the fact that they're kind of ingrained in the Kula system and they're then going into a different system. That, I imagine, poses difficulties as well. Well, that's, that's a very, very interesting question, Ocean, because sometimes you get guys with a club scenario. It's really interesting you're asking that question. Sometimes you get guys in a club scenario, which is extremely professionally run, like an inter-county team, which Kula are. Matty Kenny is a very ex experienced man. They've had a lot of success. And the difficulty is they come into uh, a county setup where early doors, they perceive this is nowhere near as professional as what we're used to. And then what happens is that prevaricates throughout the group dynamic. The Kula boys are chatting to the Kilmacud boys and they're chatting then to the Crave Kiran boys and they're chatting to the Fogs boys and they're going, this is crap, lads. You want to see what we're doing with Kula. And the minute that happens, you're in great difficulty because the manager has lost you. You may not be aware of it yourself as a player, but the minute you start to question your management setup. So what the Kula boys need to do is they need to come in I don't know, is it something they, they would sit down with Anthony Cunningham and, and Pat Gilroy? I would probably argue no. There needs to be kind of... Gilroy and Cunningham need, need, need to have their own head. Cooler boys need to come into this thing and bring a positivity with them into the setup. I think they will, because I think there's, there's five or six straightaway top-class inter-county players. And I think the professional boys, the only difficulty that will occur is if they start... I suppose in human resources, they call them terrorists within an organization. And sometimes it takes just one or two within the group dynamic to start knocking from, from, from the inside. And that's the difficulty. But I think, listen, they're on a high. They'll want to get in with Dublin. They're needed for Dublin. And I think Pacquiao is an extremely professional individual who will know how to harness from them and, and, and kind of forensically get into what they do with Kula as well and pick bits from that. You know, he, he's, he's not an expert no more than any of us are. So you harness what the Kula boys have and you build going forward. That's the key. And I think Gilroy has that ability as a man and as a manager. Yeah, Anthony Daly has a great line in the Examiner this morning. He said, if I was Pat Gilroy after Dublin's defeat to Tipperary yesterday, the first thing I would have done was drive down the M50, go into Finnegan's and Dawkey, order a couple of pints and begin the sweet talking to the Kula boys, probably singing above in the stools. And if a couple of them still weren't up out of the bed yet, I'd have gone around to their houses and woken them up for a chat. And he's not far wrong. There is a huge need for these boys, especially when you look at potentially the ball retention skills on show in Croke Park yesterday. And I guess we should move on to this uh, quarterfinal in Croke Park yesterday. And... I, that, that's my question to you. That this ball retention and the errors that Dublin had, I think Tipperary got 12 scores off uh, Dublin errors yesterday. Do you put that more down to their ferocious Tipperary performance and their hunger to get the ball back off Dublin or just poor Dublin skills? Well, it's a mixture of both, to be honest with you. I mean, the quality of player that, that Tipperary have is well known. They're, they're, they are ahead of Dublin in where they are and have always been ahead of Dublin, which is why Dublin kind of need everybody. And let's face it, Tipperary have their own demons over the last number of years. They've not put back-to-back -back All Ireland finals, and I, I, I would have a huge respect for Tipperary and a huge respect for their tradition. But 
if I was to be critical, I would say by not putting back to backs, it's a black mark against them because the ability and the talent is there and they should be and they should have done it to date. And I think it hurts them. I think it hurt Eamon, Cor a a Eamon O'Shea. I think it hurt, it's hurt Michael Ryan. It's interesting they've used over 30 players in the league. Um, du Dublin are on a different plane. It's only when when, when Pat gets, gets these... I, I don't know why we would question why the cooler boys may not go back. I don't know what, I don't what, what's in question here. Why wouldn't they I go back? I think it's just a matter of how many of them will go back rather than if they go back and how difficult it's going to be to settle back in because you are jumping from, like you say, being an All-Ireland winner to a different setup. Now, you've covered it and you've said it, and I'm glad you did, that Pat Gilroy is incredibly professional. So I don't think that kind of rot that you talk about that might happen in other counties would happen here. I, yeah. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Regards to Tipperary, it's a good point that Owen has raised um, and the fact that they're trying to strengthen the squad because it's been said many times with the Munster Championship and the format that it's now in, you're going to need more players. There's guys in your squad who were numbers 20 to 26 who might have lost interest going into the summer because they knew they weren't going to get games. Those guys have a chance of getting games now. And we're seeing with Tipperary, he's testing them. The likes of Billy McCarthy, the likes of Alan Brown. They stepped up yesterday. Would you have been impressed by them? Uh, do you think they've, they've shown enough to suggest that, OK, this year Tipper just that bit deeper? Well, again, I would say a, a, a lot we won't see. We'll, we'll see what we'll see of them on days like yesterday own. But really, it's what he sees down in the training park and how they're setting up down in the training park. But the point you make about the way the championship has been run this year, uh, crucially, absolute crucial. And again, you're right. I mean, we're going into a spate of games starting from May to a championship system and format that we're just not used to, but the players have been crying out for. Injuries will be picked up. The level of physicality that will be involved in these games. I mean, these are, every one of these is a high profile, crunch championship game that you cannot afford to start losing your first or second games. Then there's huge doubt. You'll pick up injuries, players will get tired. You must have a, a depth of strength in, in your squad. And I think that's what the likes of Michael Ryan has been doing, to be fair to him, to, to bring this infusion a bit easier own in the likes of Tipperary probably to bring these guys in when you look at the quality and calibre of player that they have around them where they're not expected to come in and be the number one player. Teams like Dublin are looking for this find to come in and be kind of our saviour and you need a couple of guys that are going to come in and be a top scorer for you. Tip aren't necessarily looking for that, but what they are looking for is a quality of player that will come in and fit with the tip way of playing Hurling and all that being a tip player you know, requires, which is which is a laudable thing, to be honest with you. So Michael Ryan is building nicely, but you're right in what you're saying. Again, Owen, this is what he's been doing. It's not necessarily about winning a league. It's about preparing a championship and have I got a squad of players that can sustain us through a championship system and bring us all the way to the end of August. Uh, just a final point, then, Dahi, you must mention Wexford, and it felt like another huge event uh, between Wexford and Galway at the weekend. Huge emotion from the fans, huge emotion from Davy afterwards. Like, after the rattling they got off Galway in the second half of that Leinster final last year, do you feel that this was a watershed moment at all? Absolutely. Every single time Wexford do what Wexford did the weekend is a watershed moment. Um, Davy Fitzgerald deserves enormous credit for what he's done with this group of players. And it's... It's not just Davy; it's the structure and it's the professionalism that it, that he brings to it. It, it. it 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 must it must be mentioned. It's it's not it's not a coincidence that it's the professional structure. It's there's no lack of funding going into Wexford, which is the way it should be if you want to be competing at where you're competing. Seven thousand plus turning up again the weekend and I've heard a lot of people talking about and I heard Dale over the weekend as well discussing, you know, well listen, we know that Galway are. Are, are, are not where they're at at the moment, so on and so forth. I don't agree with that. I think Galway went down and they left it all out there. They had a go and they didn't want to. They did not want to lose. It's a little bit like Mayo yesterday. Galway didn't want to lose, so it's not a case to me of okay, Galway lost that. Let's get back to the training park. I think Galway would relish a chance against Kilkenny next weekend. It's a lovely little build up to it. Davy and Wexford deserve huge credit. They're a fine side. They're a good side and they will cause a hell of a lot of problems this year. Yeah, it's going to be another great weekend of GAA action. Dahi okay. Regan, thanks very much for your time. Great stuff. Have a great day, boys. The other big story of the weekend, and Oshin will be able to tell us about this in a few moments, is of course Carlo getting promotion uh, back to Division 1B in the National Hurling League. Oshin was down there in Port Leash on Saturday as part of that doubleheader, and he caught up with a few of the players after their win.
Well, here in Port Leash with Edward Byrne and uh, Richard Cody of Carlo, we're also joined by Paul Cody in the background there. Uh, Richard, I'll start with you. Carlo, back up to Division 1B. How important a win is that? How big a win is that? Yeah, look, it's it's, it's huge. It's huge. Um, can't say how, how how big it is really for the county and the hurling win, Carlo. Um, you know, like I said, we're a small hurling community, but we're a very passionate crowd down in Carlo, and I think we deserve we deserve and we really want to be in Division One hurling. You know, and we've tried for we haven't won since 2012, and we've been to finals. We've been beaten in three or four finals, and it was heartbreak to you, true. But I think this this team, they're a young bunch of lads, and I think this team needs to be in Division One order to progress Carlo hurling. So uh, we're delighted. We're absolutely delighted. Today. Edward Byrne, you were in full forward, although occasionally you drop back into your own half back line. What was the what was the difference this year? What was the difference in this final as compared to the ones that has just been mentioned by Richard? Yeah, I suppose last year um, uh, we were we went up to Newry. It was a bad day or whatever. We were playing a good Antrim side. We knew how tough they were and all. We went up to hurl, but Antrim went up and they, or came down to Newry and they, and they bit us in the battle, you know. So we decided this year like we need, we needed to be prepared for the battle straight away and we gave Westmead everything we had in that first 15 minutes and just to see where we stand, you know. I mean, the game is not won the first 15 minutes, but it can definitely be lost in that 15 minutes, you know. And we kind of set the tempo there for that first first half and. I, I'm, luckily I carried this over the line in the end you know Paul Cody how important is it for you as hurdlers that you're now back among the big boys you're back in Division 1B it's very important I think to be, to be in the ranked in the top 12 in Ireland is, is important for Carlo and we have only six senior hurling clubs in Carlo not many people know that like, and Carlo has to be up there to promote hurling Carlo and you know if we were down in 2A or suffering around there you know football might take over hurling won't be that but to be in 1B and, and to learn and play with the Galways and play with Dublins and it's only going to bring us on and, and that's where we want to go Finally Richard this has to be a starting point not a finishing point right? Absolutely yeah hopefully now this is going to kick starters um, look we have a, a tough group in the Joe McDonald but there's a great prize at the end of it so you know I want to hit the ground running in, in, in May and hopefully get a few wins under our belts and be in the last two is our aim and, and we'll see from there if we can go up to Lee McCarthy we can give it a right, right good crack but you know there's serious work to be done between now and then but hopefully it's a, it's a good starting point anyway. Fantastic story. Six senior clubs, Oshin. That is insane. It's amazing. And when you see the skills of these boys, they're right up there with any county. If they can bring the intensity that you need at Division 1B, they have a real chance. It's great for a number of reasons. It's great for financial reasons, because if you've got Waterford and Galway coming in Dublin as well, obviously more people are going to want to see that. If you're a kid in Carlow and you're like 10 or 11 years of age and Carlow are playing with the greatest respect to them and Mead or Westmead, you might not be kind of too pushed to go if you're a parent, you might not be too pushed to go. If Austin Gleeson is coming to town and you have any interest in hurling, you might go and watch Austin. That's a good point. You might want to be Austin, you might play hurling and that will help Carlo and then they'll see, oh my God, we've actually got local heroes as well and you get that knock-on effect. It's like with, uh, with, with the rugby, you know, we see the local heroes and it's had a knock-on effect. So it's, it's a huge, huge deal for Carlo to do what they've done and they did it in some style as well. Yeah, they're the trendiest GA county right now. They are, they're the it county, yeah. So fair play to them, up to Division 3 in the football, up to 1B in the hurling. And um, look, they have got a lot right in Carlo. This isn't just coincidence. I mean, mm. look, they've done it because they've got good players, but they've also backed it up with good organisation and two good managers in Turlock O'Brien in the football and uh, Cormac Bonner, uh, Colin Bonner. Sorry, I always get that wrong. Colin Bonner in the hurling. Yeah, it's going to be a great story throughout the summer, hopefully, in both codes. And one we're going to follow intently. Uh, it's competition time once again. If you missed earlier on, we're giving you uh, another chance to enter our golf competition because the Off the Ball Golf Weekly Masters Preview Day is back. Once again, we're warming up for the opening major of the year at Luttrellstown Castle Golf Club in Dublin on Wednesday, April 4th. The day will include 18 holes of golf at Luttrellstown Golf Club, followed by food and the live Off the Ball Masters Preview in the clubhouse with some of Ireland's top golfers. Everyone who enters will also be put in the draw for a year's membership at Luttrellstown. And all this week on OTBAM, we're giving you the chance to come along. Every day we're giving away two two balls so you can bring along a friend with you as well. And to enter, all you've got to do is tag the mate you would bring along in the comments below if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Or if you're watching on Twitter, just tag them in a reply to this Periscope stream. We'll announce the winner at the end of the show and there will be more chances to win over the coming days on Off The Ball and OTBAM. Right, it is time to turn back to GEA, but a GEA story of uh, a different kind and perhaps of a more important kind because Nafina faced losing 75% of their facilities for up to a decade on Movi Road. OTB's Darren Cleary has been out to the club and here is his report. 
I'm here at Nafina GAA Club in Dublin reporting for Off the Ball. 3,000 members call Nafina home. It's home to over 125 competitive teams. And this week the club was rocked with the news that everything here in front of me and behind me, this main pitch and two all-weather pitches, have been requisitioned as part of a plan to build the Metro Link. We're here to talk to members to find out their concerns and their fears as their club is now fighting for survival. What has the last couple of days been like? Uh, they, they've been tough. I mean, like, uh, I was in Skullmovie there behind us. Uh, we grew up here. We played on the pitches. We hung around as teenagers on the pitches. Uh, Sarah's about to have a, a child that we'd hope would have the same life and uh, great times that we had here in the community. And uh, we don't know what's going on. There's such an uncertainty here. Uh, we're hoping it won't happen, but we, we just don't know. So it's been tough the last couple of days. And... Sarah, I get the sense I'm talking to people that it's more than just kind of pitches. If you could sum up what the area is, could you do that in a couple of words? Uh, this has been our whole life. Um, as Aidan said, we grew up here, but our whole friendship group is here. Our whole social circle is here. We socialise here every weekend. We go to every match possible just because we love it that much. And to think in four years' time that this little baby or little child won't have the same nursery facilities that are here at the moment is just so sad. It's just not okay. It's actually been a bit traumatic. I'm a member here for 40 years. I saw this club before this building was here. Um, I saw it before the All Weathers were here. I've seen the club start, thrive. I've seen it thrive. This is absolutely, this is a kick in the guts. This has ripped us apart. Well, I won't say ripped us apart, but it has absolutely, it's been a kick in the guts is the best way of phrasing it. Been described as tearing the heart and soul out of the community. What does it mean? Can you put into words how or why this could potentially tear Nafina's heart and soul out? Um, I don't think you'll ever tear the heart and soul out of Nafina. We will build. We will build. But it's just look at the look at the kids that are here today. My kids are here. I came across one of the girls that I used to babysit for her as I was growing up. Now she's going to be living on my road, and my kids will babysit her kids. I have three kids in this club. I want them to have the same experience. As I had. This club is part and parcel of my life and I want that for other children here. That's why I'm involved here on a Saturday morning on a voluntary basis. That's why I train teams. It's all about passing on what this club has given us. It, it, it's a disaster and you know that it's not going to be for just three weeks or three years. You know it's going to be at least six, maybe ten and that that would be devastating for the club. And where are, when you look around, where are all these children going to go on a Saturday morning with no other grounds? It's a disgrace. And there are alternatives. They're always talking about underground. There's plenty of place around here for an underground train if they want, if they have to have it, which I don't think they do have to have it. We have pl- a lot of transport all around the whole city. I think that those who are planning these things should come out, spend three months of the year in the vicinity, be part of the locality and see the damage they're doing. They can't see this by sitting in an office chair and looking at a map. That's not good enough. It's human beings they're thinking of. We are thinking of them, but they're not thinking of human beings. They're not thinking of the future of these children. Johnny is as, is as approachable here like as, as, uh, as any of the rest of us or, or, or as any of the players. Uh, and there is something, something very special. Johnny came down yesterday evening and he was, he was fixing nets at the back of uh, one of the goals, for instance, and suddenly he was swamped by, 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 uh, by, by, by some of his fan base. And, and that's the type of guy he is. And, and Johnny is, 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 is a wonderful example of, sort of what's come through this club. And he's been playing here, he started here probably in the nursery himself and he's worked his whole way through. So, you know, are we to lose certain potential to Johnny Coopers along the way as a result of, uh, of this change? Because, I mean, you know, people will say, look, it's only seven years that, that we'd be without pitches or whatever. Yeah, yeah, seven years. But seven years is, 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 uh, is a generation. We need additional pitches. We are struggling right now 
my facilities committee with the grounds committee develop a new pitch in our grounds up in Collinstown near the airport. We have another three acres up there full of trees and scrub that we also want and need to, de to develop. So we're looking for more pitches. We're not in the business of giving back pitches. We are struggling for pitches. The sense of scale here sometimes is, is, is a challenge to communicate. Along with our membership, we interact on a weekly basis with 10 primary schools in our local community. We serve those 10 primary schools and, and we pay our membership funds the support for those 10 primary schools in their physical education. So we Could that not be done if you, if you were on a different pitch? If you were up in a green space, if you're up in, say, Abbottstown, if you're in Johnstown Park, if you're in St. Vincent School, do you need this green space in particular to engage with those 10 local schools? Uh, so this, this strikes fundamentally to the heart of what of, of what the concept of Gaelic games, what the concept of a common Luke Lost Quail is about. A common Luke Lost Quail is about locality. It's about a, a, attachment to a sense of place. It's about a pride in your local community. It's about your locality. We're not about finding a space outside of the M50 where people need to be bused to, where our children to be ferried at. We operate best when we sit at the heart of our local community. Yeah, Darren Cleary there reporting for Off the Ball and you can catch the full report around 12 to 15 minutes of that on YouTube. It's available now. And Darren Cleary joins us now in studio. Good morning to you, Darren. Good morning, Owen. Uh, I used to live on Movi Road and I can tell you Nafina is probably the busiest GA club in the country. They're the busiest one I've ever seen, particularly on a Saturday morning and you were out there on Saturday morning. It's very hard to put into kind of context just how crazy that place is and the amount of kids who depend on that place for their Gaelic games. Yeah, it's a sight to behold. I think over the last few days... We've heard the reaction, uh, and it's all been branded Nafina this, Nafina that, but there's a very human element to the club. You saw there a kid picking up a hurl or a football for the first time, and one of the founding members, Paddy King, very, very different scales of the, the age bracket. So it is very much a, a club that caters for all ages and, and all levels. Uh, it's, it's something you have to witness to really get a sense of it, and I hope that's what we, uh, we did to try and convey what it means to people. And there is genuine concern and alarm here, um, just given the fact that they've been told that they risk losing Movie Road, which it must be pointed out that while they do play in a lot of pitches, and a lot of people will look at Nafina and say, Nafina play all over the city, why do they need this particular pitch? Put them in one of the many council pitches they use, which is true, they use Benevin, they use St Vincent School, they have their facilities up in Collinstown as well. But Movie Road is the only one they actually have any kind of control over. They can book it, they can choose when they play on it, they have full control over it. While at the council pitches, they're at the mercy and the good graces of the council, allowing them to use those pitches. So it is a sizable impact to lose three of the four pitches in that facility, which would, in essence, shut down the uh, the nursery, which I think when we were there had over 200, 250 kids on, on Saturday, perhaps more, at all levels of, of, of the game starting out. What are the chances of this thing actually happening? There's obviously been a lot of lobbying happening over the last seven days, and we're actually in the very early stages of this because they didn't hear about it until around Paddy's weekend. So it's very hard to get a gauge right now of how likely this thing is to be stopped. But from what you heard on Saturday, is the mood optimistic? The mood is a little bit fearful. I think they were caught on the hop. They were shocked. The first they heard about it was the bank holiday Friday. The chairman was actually in Zambia on a doing some charity work and he got a call at half four before Paddy's weekend to say uh, there's some implications for you and your club and an announcement we'll be making next week when can we sit down and he was kind of caught on the hop and wasn't expecting this call so they scheduled a meeting which happened on the Tuesday before the government announcement on the Thursday and only then did the full scale of what was happening was it made known to the Nafina executive who then had 24 hours to brief their members that if this does go ahead this is what we risk losing it's hard to say at this point moment in time what will happen and um, they're alarmed I wouldn't say it's optimism at the moment they haven't quite got there yet they're trying to rally they're trying to put on a united front and do anything they can really to formulate some kind of plan lobbying would be very important they have the full backing of the GAA which I think is crucial the GAA have also expressed disappointment with how little notice Nafina got less than 48 hours before being told they're going to lose 75 percent of their grounds for a period of between three and six years which could be, by best estimates, up to 10, as early as 2020. So at the moment, it's, the optimism hasn't kicked in just yet because they've had very little time to process this news. Have they had any meetings? Have they had any discussions? Because as we talk about this, and even the people in the club talk about this, there's an awful lot we don't know. There's an awful lot we don't know, and I think that's the problem. The, the fear comes from the absence of information and people not quite knowing if, if this is the last plan that the NTA arrived at or whether this was their first plan. 
it's hard to know as well where to go because if it doesn't go through Nafina, it's not really logical to shift it 50 metres across the road because you've got a row of houses there in Movie Road where Owen mentioned he uh, lived at one time, resided the other side as well. There's houses too, so you're kind of caught between a literal rock and a hard place. Do you plough through the club or do you plough through houses? It's very, very difficult. I think at the moment the members will be briefed on Thursday night. That's their a kind of information evening. But at this particular point in time, I think they're trying to assess all their options before deciding what they can do. Now pardon me for being cynical. We are at an early stage. They've been told about this and they haven't taken it in yet. I appreciate that. But is there a potential for Nafina to actually make something out of this? If they lose their grounds through a CPO or whatever it's called, can they say, yeah, okay, we'll move for a while, but you have to make it worth their while or you have to buy us new facilities or we have to get something tangible out of this? Is there any suggestion that there could actually be a positive element to this? It depends on what level they're engaged at by the, the government and the people who are spearheading the project. I'm not so sure they want to turn this negative into a positive. They very much, from the sense I got speaking to people, just leave us alone. We've worked very hard to put our pitches together. We've got two all-weather pitches that are state-of-the-art while not full size, And we've got our main pitch, which is the pride and joy in the nursery and, and youth development, very, very important for There's them. There's the potential for growth. At the moment, it sounds like they don't have the facilities to match the demand. And I appreciate that greenfield sites where they are might be difficult to come by, but it sounds like they need a bit of something and this could be the opportunity. We got there a little bit earlier. The last day, Niall McGrath did the edit on the video and shot the video. We got there a little bit early. And the striking thing for me in the first half an hour there were how many of the kids strolled in, walked in. The GAA is very much about the locality, your local club, pride of place. It is the hub of the community for people as young as four to people as old as 80, 85. And I just think if you lift it up, it's not an American football franchise. You can't just take it up and move it 10 miles down the road and it will still retain what it's meant to be. I think when you look at the kids, you see them actually strolling up and arriving there. Like, kids at all ages, if they have that local community, they will aimlessly go there. They will never make a plan. They'll just show up at the pitches and hang around there all day. That's what people of a certain age do. That's what I'm sure you did in your local GA club and on yourself. So I think, well, I'm sure they will be accommodated if they're going to move them but I don't think you can replace what they have. I think the sense I get from the club and speaking to people there, it's not about pitches, it's not about lines on the pitch, it's not about goals, it's about that being the centre and the hub of their community. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's something that we certainly found last week in Dublin 8 as well, that it didn't matter that they could travel to a GA pitch, it was, I guess, the problems that people can run into if they don't have a parent that's able to drive them however many miles to actually get to that pitch, so it's a very valid point. It's a great piece of work, as I say, you should check out the full report, it's available on YouTube now, and if you've got any comments at all, you can tweet us at Off The Ball, or you can follow us on Facebook and YouTube as well. Uh, just to tell you who's won our competition today, the competition winner is is Owen Shaw. He tagged his mate Con McGrath, so congratulations Owen and Con. You've got yourself a two ball at Luttrellstown next week on our Off The Ball slash Golf Weekly Masters preview day. Uh, before we wrap up though, uh, final word to Oshin and Darren's going to hang around as well because uh, Neil Francis, I regret to inform you, has been at it again. Uh, the people <laughs> are embracing rugby as our new national sport and rightly so, read the headline in yesterday's Sunday Independent. Just read you out a couple of lines from it because uh, we don't have much time. It's kind of uh, a, a word each really. Uh, I watched the FAI struggle with their player supply. Some obscure 20-somethings born in England of Irish parents playing fitfully and inconsistent for second division clubs. Jack Grealish of Aston Villa, Liam Kelly of Reading. And then the best line really, hurling is a parochial sport. What are the other 29 counties doing when these counties are strutting their stuff? How inclusive is a sport that no more than seven counties in total can ever hope to win in All-Ireland? What percentage of the population is that? World rugby, of course, being a 350 country sport. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, he's like the guy at the bar. You know the annoying guy who purposely goes around winding people up and he thinks he's hilarious and he does this, literally does this. <laughs> That's what Frano is doing. You can't deny that he actually does have a good argument about hurling. It is a small sport and it's not... Even, like I, I made this argument with uh, GPA members when I uh, was in Boston a couple of years ago for a Super 11. Paid my way over, by the way. It wasn't a junket for me. I said, why are you trying to grow it here when you haven't grown it in your own country, right? So he's got a bit of a... He has got a bit of a point there. I've always said... Don't encourage him. No, but like, regards rugby, uh, when Darrell Breen said it tongue-in-cheek a couple of weeks ago, it's the people's game. It's some of the people's game. It's a popular game, and there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't infringe on any other sport. It doesn't lessen any other sport. So I've no problem with the people's game argument. Frano, in his article yesterday, I thought it was hilarious. He kind of... He takes these straw polls, but takes them as absolute fact. So he's spoken to four people who love rugby. Therefore, 
everyone must love rugby. <laughs> Women love rugby is, is yeah, the, the thing I took that, from the That article. wasn't even worth mentioning. When yeah. I picture Frano sitting down to write his pieces, I get a scene from The Simpsons where Grandpa Simpson sits at his typewriter and says, there are too many sports. Please eliminate <laughs> three of them. That's what Frano does. Old he Frano literally has... Yeah, he has these wonderful ideas which have very little basis in reality and then reports them as fact. I think that's a pretty good note to leave it on. Darren Cleary, Oshin Langan, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, we are back tomorrow morning from 7.45, as always, on Facebook and on Periscope and on YouTube. The radio show is back on News Talk from 7 o'clock tonight. Joe and the lads will be in the hot seats. We'll chat to you later. Good luck. OTB AM. In association with AIR. Get AIR Sport free with AIR Broadband.